Haman's at the peak of power. He's the second most important person in what was the biggest empire on earth at that time. He's second only to the king. And he's got plans, hasn't he? And they're in place. And he's planning to rock up to the king and ask for Mordecai's death. And he's already sent out the edict and the Jews are going to be killed, as we've heard. So that's where we pick up the story, at the beginning of chapter 6. Let's read. That night sleep escaped the king, so he ordered the book recording daily events to be brought and read to the king. They found the written report of how Mordecai had informed on Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the entrance when they planned to assassinate King Ahasuerus. The king inquired, What honour and special recognition has been given to Mordecai for this act? The king's personal attendants replied, Nothing has been done for him. The king asked, Who is in the court? Now Haman was just entering the outer court of the palace to ask the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows he had prepared for him. The king's attendants answered him, Haman is there, standing in the court. Have him enter, the king ordered. Haman entered and the king asked him, What should be done for the man the king wants to honour? Haman thought to himself, Who is it the king would want to honour more than me? Haman told the king, For the man the king wants to honour, have them bring a royal garment that the king himself has worn, and a horse the king himself has ridden, which has a royal crown on its head. Put the garment and the horse under the charge of one of the king's most noble officials. Have them clothe the man the king wants to honour. Parade him on the horse through the city square and call out before him, This is what is done for the man the king wants to honour. The king told Haman, Hurry and do just as you proposed. Take a garment and a horse for Mordecai the Jew, who is sitting at the king's gate. Do not leave out anything you have suggested. So Haman took the garment and the horse. He clothed Mordecai and paraded him through the city square, calling out before him, This is what is done for the man the king wants to honour. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate. But Haman hurried off for home, mournful, with his head covered. I'm just going to finish there for now. What a turnaround. What a turnaround. You would have heard the saying, pride comes before a fall. Have you ever seen such a sharp demonstration of that adage? Haman's pride. Here he is in all his pomp, exercising the privilege of his position. He's waiting in the palace courtyard early in the morning to see the king and ask for Mordecai's execution. Later that same morning, he's leading his enemy, Mordecai, through the city, proclaiming, This is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. What's brought about this sudden turn of events? Who or what is responsible for Haman's fortunes being so suddenly reversed? Before we look at it, let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we've read in the Psalms this morning of how good you are and how you provide for us in so many ways. Uh, Lord, we're going to look at that here in this book too. We pray that as we do that, you would speak to us and that we would know you better and love you more and be your people more fully. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you could read this account and say it's just luck or coincidence that causes this dramatic pivot. It just so happens the king cannot sleep. It just so happens that he asks for the book recording daily events to be read for him. It just so happens that the book is open at the page where Mordecai's good deed is recorded. It just so happens that the king did not reward the man who saved him five years ago. Quite an oversight. It just so happens that Haman is in the courtyard when the king is looking for advice. It just so happens that the king does not mention who he is seeking to honour. It just so happens that Haman in his pride thinks that it is himself that the king wants to reward. That's a lot of coincidences. The writer of Esther layers them up, one after the other. 
so heavily, we have to think to ourselves, that would not happen. It's just too much. That's impossible. That's what we're meant to think. Unless there's someone controlling these events. Unless there's a purpose behind these events. And this whole cascade of circumstances is initiated by that night sleep escaped the king. So he ordered the book recording daily events to be brought and read to him. The king being unable to sleep is like the first rock that moves and starts a landslide. Now, if it was just the coincidences themselves, we might say something else was the turning point in Esther. But the writer uses a number of literary devices to make sure we look here, right at chapter 6, verse 1. Now, there was a little handout in your newsletters, which I hope you all got. It gives you two of these devices. The book of Esther contains a series of banquets. There are two at the beginning of the book, two at the finish of the book. There are two which celebrate the rise of Esther and the rise of Mordecai. And then in the middle, there are two banquets that Esther hosts as queen. They are at the beginning of chapters 5 and 7. And right in the middle of those two banquets, chapter 6, verse 1. As well as that, the rise of Haman and his plans, right through chapters 3 to 5, is mirrored by the rise of Mordecai and Haman's undoing in chapters 6 to 8. And that mirroring, it's not just a general, like, he falls and he rises. It's not just that. It's also in the details. And I've given you a bit of a list there. For example, in chapter 4, verse 1, Mordecai goes through the city wearing sackcloth and ashes and weeping in sorrow. And then by chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, Mordecai is being led through the city in royal robes, being honoured. And now Haman is going through the city mourning and with his head covered. That's one example, but there are many. And that list in there isn't exhaustive. There's more, if you look. Everything in Esther centres on that night sleep escaped the king. The writer does not consider that whole list of coincidences just to be happenstance. These events are God at work. God is directing these events to fulfil his promises and to achieve his purposes and plans. Now, a minute ago, I used the analogy of a rock starting a landslide down a hill. But a landslide is uncontrolled. So the analogy is wrong. God is directing each of these coincidences. Every one. This is not uncontrolled landslide. This is a landslide with God directing each and every point. God is protecting his people and bringing the enemies of his people down. No one among his people knows the danger to Mordecai. No one has been praying for Mordecai to be saved. God does that solely on his initiative. Mordecai's pronouncement in 4 verse 14 that liberation and deliverance will come from another place is proven true. Esther doesn't do anything. Mordecai doesn't do anything. God does something. But Esther and Mordecai, they don't know God has acted. They have to go on in faith, not knowing what has already been done. The only ones who know what's already been done are Haman and Zeresh and their inner circle. And Zeresh sums up her response in 6 verse 13. Since Mordecai is Jewish and you have begun to fall before him, you won't overcome him because your downfall is certain. 
Now, she doesn't acknowledge that God's at work, but she has some sense that the Jews are a protected people and that Haman's destiny is now sure. Behind Zeresh's words, there's a subtle recognition that Jews are a race apart. And it's recognised in other places here too. It's recognised in Haman's words to the king about a troublesome people. It's recognised in the decree that follows, and it's there in Zeresh's words earlier in Esther 2. And then, before Haman can recover his equilibrium from this shock, he's led off to Esther's second banquet. Now remember, Esther and the king do not know God has humbled Haman. As far as they're concerned, Haman is still in the ascendancy. He's still powerful. And so Esther must tread very carefully. Reading from the beginning of chapter 7. The king and Haman came to feast with Esther the queen. Once again, on the second day, while drinking wine, the king asked Esther, Queen Esther, whatever you ask will be given you, whatever you seek, even to half the kingdom will be done. Queen Esther answered, If I have found favour with you, your majesty, and if the king is pleased, spare my life, this is my request, and spare my people, this is my desire. For my people and I have been sold to destruction, death and annihilation. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept silent. Indeed, the trouble wouldn't be worth burdening the king. King Ahasuerus spoke up and asked Queen Esther, Who is this and where is the one who would devise such a scheme? Esther answered, The adversary and enemy is this evil Haman. Now, it's easy to see the second banquet is a contest between two powerful players in palace politics, Esther versus Haman. And the way Esther leads slowly to her accusation against Haman, it's, it's an exercise in politics. She's humble. The king is attached to her, not to the Jewish people. And so he, she appeals to the king's pleasure in her. Also, just as Haman did, she does not name the Jews. She speaks in general terms of a people, her people, at least initially. And she doesn't mention the king's role in the first edict going out. She leaves that bit out. It's possible the king doesn't even recognise his role in it. But Haman knows. Haman knows what he's done. Haman knows the danger. When the king asks his question, who is this and where is the one who would devise such a scheme? Haman knows. He knows he's lost. Once the king knows Haman is the man, a great anger awakens in him. Now that anger is probably because he's stuck in this dilemma. His foolishness and impetuousness have trapped him. He's going to lose face because he he unwisely allowed Haman to issue his edict, this edict. A queen who is under his protection is going to die because of his edict. Or he might lose face because he protects the queen from his irrevocable edict. What will he do? And another coincidence, Haman just happens to be falling on the couch as the king comes back in. And that makes the decision easy for the king. He's caught Haman in a compromising position with his queen and he gives the order, execute him. And after Haman's executed, the king's anger just goes away. He's not in his dilemma anymore. He's not concerned for the Jews All the king's concerned about is how he looks in the face of the people. This is the great king, ruler of the greatest empire on earth. This king fails to reward the man who revealed the plot against his life. This king 
does not intend to raise Mordecai up so high. This king, he does not intend to embarrass Haman, but he does so. This king is not in control of events at all. He is blown this way and that by the people and events around him. He's powerful, but at least inept. He's negligent, hands power out to Haman, and Haman does what he wants with it. Impetuous fool, principally concerned with how others around see him. And the contrast between this king and God, who works in the tiniest little thing. The gifts Esther uses, her beauty, her wisdom, her position, who did they come from? Surely Esther has to act. Surely she has to be brave and to utilise what God has given her in order to overthrow Haman. But God is at work here as well. It is his plan, his purpose and his promise that the Jews will be saved. They are a people under his protection. In chapter 8, the great reversal which began with the king's sleepless night rolls on. The events of the rise of Haman are mirrored by the rise of Mordecai. The parallels abound. You've got some of them in your hand out there. Even the account of the counter-edict to save the Jews mirrors the account of the edict of annihilation going out. And chapter 8 ends with the Jews celebrating. Beginning in verse 15. Mordecai went from the king's presence clothed in royal blue and white with a great gold crown and a purple robe of fine linen. The city of Susa shouted and rejoiced, and the Jews celebrated with gladness, joy and honour. In every province and every city where the king's command and edict reach, gladness and joy took place among the Jews. There was a celebration and a holiday. The reversal is complete, almost, almost. The edict against the Jews has not been reversed, but it has been rendered powerless by another edict. And next week we'll see how that plays out. So what are we to make of these chapters? We are to at least make that 6 is the decisive chapter. If we look at the other candidates for hero of the story, Esther is not even mentioned. Mordecai is a passive, unaware participant. He doesn't know that Haman has gallows prepared for him. He begins his chapter sitting at the gate with the edict hanging over the Jews and he ends the chapter in exactly the same situation, sitting at the gate and the edict still hanging. But the tide has already turned. The enemies of God's people are on the run. Yet God's decisive intervention does not make human action meaningless, does it? Haman's fate might already be inevitable by the chapter of, end of chapter 6. Sir Esh has said as much. But Esther still has to stand up and contest the king's favour. She still has to be brave and wise. God's name may not be mentioned in Esther, but God's hand is everywhere. When everything is running in Haman's favour, when hope appears lost for the Jews, then God acts and sleep escapes the king. Such a little thing. And the great reversal begins. So God works through the little things and through his people. But we should also see that God acts in and through his enemies. Haman's pride leads to his assumption that the king wants to honour him. An impetuous king makes a foolish promise to Esther, granting her request up to half his kingdom, up to half his kingdom, and he can't take it back. When the king is seeking to execute Haman, a court eunuch happens to know about the gallows Haman has built for Mordecai. God works his plans independently. He works his plans through his servants 
and he works his plans to those who are not his servants. His working does not depend on willing obedience. Rather, God's obedience, sorry, rather the obedience of God's servants is the result of his powerful work in them. God's working is not undirected. It is to a plan. He's chosen the Jews. He's promised to be with them, to protect them and make them a great nation. Likewise, he promised in Exodus 17 to completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Remember Haman's an Agagite. Agagite was the king of the Amalekites. God's promise to completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. And in Deuteronomy 25, Israel were commanded not to forget that Amalek had attacked the stragglers of the people as they were leaving Egypt. Big brave soldiers attacking the weak and those that were straggling behind. And they were told never to forget. This is an ancient... These are ancient enemies, the Amalekites and the Jews. God is working his plans when all these coincidences happen. Those who think they can oppose God or his people will be brought down. Haman's opposition to God is extremely blatant. It's, all, it's, it's so strong. But we need to beware because opposition to God can be much more subtle than that. Now, we may easily be in the world and of the world. We may well be here today with the appearance of faith, with the appearance of humility or generosity, but with our hearts still far from trusting in what God has done through Jesus. We may be full of knowledge about God and what he's done and still not know Christ. Or maybe instead we might cause trouble among God's people with our words and actions. Maybe we're the cause of division and discontent. Haman's judgment was promised. When he was so powerful, it would have seemed very unlikely he would end up on the gallows. But it was certain. The world tells us there is no judgment for those who ignore or oppose God. That's what the world tells us. Esther would tell us judgment for God's enemies is certain. Here in Esther we've seen a dramatic demonstration of God's faithfulness, providence, protection for his people. How can we be slow to trust in him? He's demonstrated his care for his people over and over in his word and in history, and yet instead in trusting in his proven goodness, we worry. We get anxious. The world seems dark and dangerous, and God seems to have lots of enemies. But God is not absent, and he is concerned about the situation of his people. Esther shows us God is at work in the little things. And the landslide of his actions is directed. And as Romans assures us, God is at work in all things. We may not see or even know what he's doing. We may not even know of the threats we are facing. Just like Mordecai. But God is at work. We've just had Easter. When our Lord Jesus was sentenced by Pilate and raised up on the cross, his enemies must have been celebrating. The scribes, the Pharisees, Satan himself appeared to have won a great victory. And Satan must have thought all his plans had borne fruit. Jesus, the Son of God, was dead. He eliminated his enemy. Now, Satan managed to get one step further than Haman. He thought he'd actually got his enemy to the gallows and killed him. Three days later. When 
think Satan was certain of his victory. God made it clear to Satan that his triumph was just a shadow. A shadow. Now, Zeresh's words to Haman could be spoken to Satan on that first Easter morning when the greatest hope dawned. Since Jesus is the Son of God and you have begun to fall before him, you won't overcome him because your downfall is certain. Brothers and sisters, Satan's downfall is certain. The victory is won. God's people cannot be defeated by Satan or by death itself. Jesus rose. He sits at God's right hand. God's plans and purposes will be completed.